Welcome back everyone to our weekly High Five, where we're gonna highlight five awesome things that are happening in the life of our church. So let's jump into it. Up at number five, we are celebrating Tony and what God is doing in her life. Tony previously has been attending our Manchester outpost and this past Saturday, she came to be baptized. It was a beautiful celebration of her faith in Jesus. Way to go, Tony. This high five goes out to you today. Up at number four, this past week, our Brandon Outpost spent their Saturday going out into their community to take on some day projects for people in need. They painted houses, built decks, and even put together wheelchair ramps. Way to go, Brandon. What an awesome way to share God's love. In at number three, participants have begun the powerful journey through Rooted this week. And this first step is a big step. Getting acquainted with people in the group, sharing some stories, and praying together over this new adventure. Like any adventure, it'll take an open mind and an open heart. But the joy of drawing closer to God and others is a great reward. On behalf of all of us here at One Church, we are sending all our Rooted groups a church-wide high five to strong roots and God's love. Here at number two, last Saturday, our Manchester Outpost threw a huge block party in conjunction with five other local churches full of food, obstacle courses, and even games of bingo. Over 500 people across all these churches joined in on the fun. High five Manchester to sharing God's love with your community. And finally, up at number one, we're celebrating Tom and Heidi and what God is doing in their lives. They've been attending our Bedford Outpost and this past Sunday, they were baptized. Tom and Heidi, we are celebrating you today. High five. Thanks for joining us for our high five and we can't wait to celebrate with you in the next one. Now. God is on the move. Isn't it wonderful? Like, it's in the little ways, it's in the big ways, but it's usually, um, we have to look for big things. But the truth is God is on the move in each and every one of our lives all the time. That God wants to use you. It's one of the things in my life is, is hard to understand that I spend a lot of time wrestling with, is that God, God is not only on the move, God not, not only wants um, the people that I know, to know that they're loved by him, to know that they're, he's, they're invited into relationship with him, but that God wants to use me in the midst of that. Because I don't know about you, but I got my own hang-ups. I got my own struggles. I got my own battles. And you're like, who am I? And we often bring before him all our insecurities and all our insufficiencies. And yet God is this wonderful God who invites us into his mission. And so sometimes we feel like um, we don't know our value or we don't know our purpose and we wrestle through things. But here's what I would say to you this evening is God wants to use your life. I don't care who you are. I, I don't care about all of the lists of things that are like, oh, this is why I can't, and oh, this is who I am, and this is, this is my past, and all this stuff. I would say God can take that and use all of it. Scripture is filled, filled with people whose lives did not look like they were supposed to look, and God says, no, I want to use you. And so we're in a series called Soul Train. And soul train is that God is on the move, and he invites us into it. And as his church grows and as his, as his people grow, you need more resources, you need more help. But as the church grows, you also start to realize is that it becomes unstoppable. And I believe that with my whole heart, that, that when, when we are as able to say as his people that, okay, God, use us. Break our boxes. Break our boxes. Break all of these different ways that we think we have to fit inside some box and just use us. And so uh, we've been going through a series called Soul Train, and it... it Every week we do like a memory verse, and it's John 3.16. You guys know John 3.16. Some of you know it. You see it like at football games, held up, like John 3.16. And we sang a song about it, right? And it says this beautiful thing, and, and I, I think it's up there. Can you all say this together with me? I, say it loud. Say it loud. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is a message of all, like, so I have screwed up so many presentations of what the good news of Jesus looks like. I don't know if you ever have. Have anybody else screwed it up? You're like, I don't even know what I'm saying. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus anymore after that presentation. I'm like, I, like, I remember, I can remember uh, sitting on a bed, uh, having a phone call, and I'm like, what in the world am I saying? And so, so here's what I would say. God wants to use your life, and you have to wrestle with that, and I have to wrestle with that. Okay, God, here's my life. Use it. Um, and, and 
so like, well, how do I do it? What do I say? And that's what you say. You say, God loves you. God so loves the world. That he so loved the world that he moved, that he acted, that he did something about it. And he calls his church to act and to move and to do something about it. And you go to school, he says, I want you to move and I want you to act and I want you to do something about it. It's so that whoever. And so often we set, we set people aside or we overlook people or we don't see people. He says, no, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I would say, we as the church, it is the wonderful, beautiful commission that we have. It's so a part of the challenge is how to get out of the way. Like, I was thinking about that. I was thinking how to get out of the way, but it's also how to be in the way at the same time of God, use me. God, use, use my life. And part of it, part of it comes from knowing who you are. I was thinking about it a lot this morning as I was kind of running through this. Is like, like sometimes the enemy, the only thing he's got is to keep us from knowing who we are is to try to deceive us, to say that we're unworthy, that we're insufficient, that God can't do anything through a little church in a city called Franklin, and, and to miss the fact, no, God is, God is doing something in us, and God is doing something through us, and God will do something through us, and, and part of the challenge is to know who you are, but sometimes life is struggle to figure out who you are. I, I, my, my buddy Mike was preaching down in Manchester, and I got to hear him a couple of weeks ago, uh, last week, and I, 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 man, as he was telling this story about himself in high school, like, oh, man, that was me. That was me. Like, like a, a, lot, I, a lot of my struggle in high school is like, who am I? Like, who, what is my identity? And if you look at what I wore and if you look at some of my senior pictures, you're like, <laughs> that guy didn't know what in the world he was doing. I was a cowboy. I mean, I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't grow up anywhere in cowboy territory at all. I grew up outside of Chicago. I was a little bit between farm and city. I was on, on the fringe, but, but, but I was not a cowboy at all. But I thought I was. And so, so freshman year, like blue jeans and white T-shirt every day. I wore a duster. I don't know if you've ever seen the duster. Anybody in the room seen the duster? It's like the big, got the big shoulders, the long black coat. I wore a cowboy hat. I'm not kidding. Every day, every day, every day, that is what I wore. Did I look weird? Absolutely. Did I know what I was doing? Did I know who I was? Absolutely not. And, and yeah. I, I, I did it, and then grunge came around. I don't know if you remember grunge coming out of Seattle, like all that out of the music and, and flannel and, and ripped jeans and, and, and all of that stuff. And, and so then I, the next thing I did is I tried to blend the two. I was grunge cowboy. Grunge cowboy, I did not pull off so well, but it was not nearly as bad as preppy cowboy because I did try preppy cowboy, and I can remember this girl's look. I remember it as I was walking down the hall one day, and I'm wearing these khaki pants with my cowboy boots, and the top of them were so thick that my it didn't look right. Let me just say that it didn't look right. And, and I actually have the senior pictures to prove it, but I, I I'll show you if you ask. But identity, not knowing who you are, not knowing who you are can cause a lot of problems in your life. Because if I don't know who I am, I start to view myself of how other people view me. And they might not have the best view of me. And really, to be honest, what's worse than them viewing who they, who, who they think I am, it's, it's my view of myself. Like, any of you struggle sometimes with the view of yourself? Like, like you, you, got, you got mistakes. Any of you got mistakes? Any of you got mistakes? Any of you got, any of you got a past? Any of you got struggles? And like, oh, man, how I view myself. But learning who we are, knowing who we are. So we're in Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a popular chapter in, in Romans. But before you get there, you go through 11 chapters. You go through 11 chapters of mess. You go through 11 chapters of, of what we feel in life. You go through these 11 chapters where it says, like, the world is messed up. You read chapter 1, the world is messed up. The world is messed up. Chapter 3, it's like, yeah, the world is messed up, uh, and I'm messed up. In chapter 3, it, it, not only am I messed up, but you're messed up, and we're all messed up. And, it, and so chapter 3 is like, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, 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 and in some way, you don't want to say praise God, but praise God, I'm not the only one, right? Like that's what you're on chapter 3. is like, we are all a mess. And so sometimes we sit in a church building and we're like, everybody else has got their life together. And Romans is like, no, we're, we're all pretty much a mess. And so, I mean, we can fake it pretty well sometimes. And we can put on the cowboy hat and make it look like we're cowboys or whatever, but we're still messes underneath but then in chapter 4, it starts to say, but God has made a way for people that doesn't come through themselves. It comes from a faith of believing in him. It's trusting that he can do something in their life. And then once, once you start to realize that it's something that's given by grace and it's through faith in him, you start to find what freedom is like. You're no longer a slave to things. That he's, he set you free and then, 
And then chapter 8 is, is one of the best. I, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Go read Romans chapter 8. Write it down. It, it'll say, it starts like this. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think sometimes we struggle with the know who you are. And sometimes we think we walk around condemned because of the decisions we've made. And sometimes we walk around like, oh, man, this is just holding me back. Is, like, is there anywhere in your life where sin is just like, oh, it's like holding you back or your past? Like, oh, it's just holding you back. And Jesus is saying, no, no, in fact, I've set you free from that. And now I want you to live in that freedom because as you start to know who you are and you live in that freedom, then all of a sudden you become a force. You become an unstoppable force of the world. That's why Romans chapter 8 says, like, like we, are, we are therefore more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because if God didn't spare his son, but God gave his son for us, which is what he did, if, if that is the love of God and the power of God that meets itself in the person of Jesus and God himself died for you and for me, and then his power is at work in us, it goes on to say, well, well, what then can separate us from the love of God? Like to know that you are loved with an inseparable love of God can change things. It can change cities. It can change, it can change a whole lot of things. So it starts like, I, I know now that neither height nor depth, neither angels nor demons, neither, neither life nor death, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. And I say, show me a people who understand who they are, to know who we are, and all of a sudden you become a force for the world. Like have you ever seen someone who knows who they are? All right, chapter 12. Uh, chapter 12 will say this, therefore... Therefore, in view of God's mercy, not in view of what everybody thinks about me, not in view of what I think of myself, therefore, in view of who God is and God's mercy in your life, that God will meet you wherever you are and invite you to himself, will set you free put his spirit inside you and then send you out into the world. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, here's what I want you to do. I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. It'll go on to say that this is your spiritual act of worship. This is, and, and the actual wording there is this is the only reasonable, this is the only pure and true type of worship. We can worship in a lot of different forms. We can worship in a lot of different ways. We can sing songs and we can gather in a building on a Sunday evening. There's a lot of things that we can do. But ultimately, what do you do for the God who has done everything for you? You give everything to him. You say, God, my life is yours. God, I am yours. I am not my own. Scripture will say it this way. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. You know, I don't know if I always view my life that way. Sometimes I think I'm my own. And my guess is sometimes you think that you're own and you wake up to your kingdom and you wake up to your world and, and you bring before God, 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 here's what I need you to do. Here's my mess and so I need you to fix it. And you're like, no, I'm not my own. I'm, I'm, I'm his. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, as you stare at God's mercy, I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is what real worship looks like. And then it goes on to say this. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. And I love the phrasing of that. It, it, it's, it's not just do not conform. It's keep on not conforming. Keep on not conforming. Keep on. Because what happens sometimes is we, we, we're like, we, we don't conform for a little while, and then we kind of fall into the patterns. Because it's easy to fall into the patterns. It's easy to fall into patterns. And he says, keep on not conforming to the patterns of this world. But instead, it's not just a negative. The church can't ever stop at negatives. I think I just used a triple negative there, but the church can't ever stop at negatives. See, I'll just keep saying negatives because the church can't stop at negatives. He goes on to say, I, don't want you, I want you to keep on not conforming to the patterns of this world. And you're like, well, what are the patterns of this world? Well, it's doing what everybody else is doing um, and, and, and never really showing the kingdom of God to other people. He says, but instead, I want you to keep on being transformed. God's done a work in you. God is doing a work in you. God will complete that work in you. Scripture will say, he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion, that we are being transformed into the image of Jesus, and he will not stop. And so keep on being transformed, and he says, by the renewing of your mind, by the way that you're seeing his world, and the things that he's wanting to do, rather than what you're wanting to do, and, and offer yourself to him. Know who you are. Know what you've been called to. And so we have this prayer that we pray as a church, and it's called pray for one. And really what it does, oh, not prayer for one, pray for one. And I will tell you, it really is the strategy. I mean, the, ultimately, the strategy, you are the strategy. The church is always more powerful outside of the building. The church is always more powerful when the people of the church understand who they are as the church 
that are willing to say, okay, God's mission is not only for some institution somewhere. God's mission wants to hit my life, and God wants to use my life, and God can use my life because it's his power at work. And so we pray for one. We say, Lord, every day invite me into your mission. Lord, every day invite me into what you are wanting to do. Not what I'm wanting to do. Invite me to what you are wanting to do. And I think it's beautiful because I, I know that there's a lot of things that are worthy to be prayed for. I get that, and I know our God wants to hear our prayers. I've been reading through Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy says this thing. Moses will say this thing. What other nation is so great that their God is near them and hears their prayers when they pray to him? God hears our prayers, but so often my prayers can become selfish prayers if, I, if it's not focused. And so we as a church, we pray for one. And the reason why it's so important or the reason why it's so beautiful is because it sets you into the world as you are in all your weirdness and all your goofiness and all of that stuff. And it says, okay, God wants to use me at the bank or God wants to use me at McDonald's or God wants to use me at high school or God wants to use me in all of these places. And doggone it, I'm going to be the church there and not just the church here in this moment. And so know who you are. You're called out, son or daughter of the king, invited to give your life as a living sacrifice, not some dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is what worship looks like. Keep on not conforming. Keep on being transformed. And then you'll be able to know what God's will is, good, perfect, is good and perfect will. That's why prayer is so important. We can't do anything without prayer. I see beautiful things happening. I see beautiful ha things happening for one church in Franklin. But I also know that it is not limited to this place and to this time slot. It's, it's us knowing who we are and saying, God, we trust you, and so we want to, you to, to use us in this. And so part of, part of praying for one is learning to connect to God. If we stay connected with God as the church, as we stay connected with God as, the people, as his people, he can do some amazing things through us. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay in me, stay connected to me, connect with me, and through me you will bear much fruit. Say, so God, here I am, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. Use me. Use it for your purposes. May my, may my life, however long or however short it might be, be a wonderful aroma to you. Well, it's not only knowing who you are, it's also knowing whose you are. I can say when we wrote that, and as we're talking through that, um, at first I thought know whose you are meant, oh, I'm God's, that I'm his, which is true. I am his. We are his. We are his his wonderful, beautiful possession that he loves and gave his son for. But when we talk through Romans, you'll start to realize that, that we are also somebody else's. We are each other's. We are one another's. Which is weird, and I, you know, I, I'm just going to call it out. It's kind of weird, but we, we belong to each other. If you're here, then you belong to the people who are sitting next to you. We belong to one another. And, 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 and a church is a place, it's a beautiful place where people from all different walks of life, from all different stories, from all different messes and all of this, they come together as one beautiful group of people who belong to one another. And, and I really do think that the power of the church is the Holy Spirit living in us. And we're saying, okay, we belong to each other. Because when you start to understand that you, we belong to each other, all of a sudden real community starts to form. And like, all right, we are here, we are in in it for each other, for his kingdom and with each other. But when we don't know where we belong, what happens is we don't participate. I told you about my buddy Mike, and he had this story, and I'm like, Mike, can I tell this story? And he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, tell the story. He told it, he told it last week, and I'm like, all right, I want to tell this story. So he, um, he didn't graduate high school. Like his senior year, he was like distracted, and so he didn't make it that first year, and so he became a a next year senior, he called it a super senior. I don't know if that's a thing. I don't know if he just felt like he wanted to call himself a super senior, but he's like, I'm a super senior, which sounds great. Like, who doesn't want to be a super senior? I want to be a super senior. But it turns out he didn't graduate as the super senior either. It says he, he, he said he ended up getting his, his GED. And it's like, all of that was fine and good. I'm proud of him, buddy. You got your, you, you, you got your degree. That's wonderful. But he says, things are getting weird now. Things are getting weird now because I'm starting to get the reunion questions. It was like, and I don't know where to go. I don't know if I go with that first batch because I didn't graduate with them, so I don't know if that was my class. He says, I don't know if I go with the super class because I, I wasn't a part of that class. I, you know, I didn't graduate them with them either. He says, I don't know if there's GED reunions. He's like, so you know what I did? He says, I did nothing. I didn't go. And I started to say, when you don't understand where you belong, you don't participate. 
when you don't understand that there's a place for you, when you don't understand that there's, there's a group of people that you belong with, our, our default is, well, I don't belong here, and therefore I won't participate. But what if, what if the church is a place where all people belong? What if the church is a community that every person is invited into? And I think when we as the church, we start to say, no, you belong here, you have a place here, that, that man, we are all, desperately in need and at the same time recipients of the wonderful grace of God and your mess is no worse than my mess and, and if we bring our messes together under the grace of Jesus and, and praise God we all belong here but not only do we belong but we belong to each other and so Paul will say this he says in um, verses 3 through 5 he says for by the grace given to me I say to every one of you I'm going to stop. I, I, sometimes I stop in the middle of scripture. And, because listen to what Paul's saying. He says, there's a grace at work in me. And that grace that's at work in me belongs to you. By the grace given to me, I say to you, he says. Which tells me that there's a grace at work in you that belongs to us. Isn't that strange? Because some of us say, oh, no, I can't. I can't, can't be me, and I don't know what mine is. But he says, by the grace given to me, I now say to you. And then we have to say, okay, well, what's the grace at work in me? Sometimes I think we stop, we stop too short at grace. Sometimes we stop at grace that saves us. And it's true. The wonderful grace of God saves you, that he sees us in our flaws and our sins, that he sent Jesus to die for us, and that is beautiful. But so often... We as the church, we stop there and say, no, that there's a grace now living in me. That he who began a good work in me is still doing a work through me. And that word that he uses, the word that's used of gifts and all of these things, it's that same word. It's the same word, grace. So there's the grace that saves me. Now there's the grace that is inside me that's now working through me. And so here's what I'd say. Here's, here's, what, here's what, please, I hope you can't get out of this room without understanding this. That there is the grace of, there, if you're in Jesus, there's a grace of God that's in you. That's to be used, that belongs in a lot of ways to each other. And that's beautiful. And it goes on to say, I, I told you, I'll, I'll keep reading. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Why is that a problem? Because if I think, if I think that my world and my kingdom is so important, what can happen is I can have a high view of myself and my world, and it means that I'm not going to belong to the others because I'm caught up in my own stuff, in my own calendar, in my own timetable, in my own stuff. And I, I don't know how many times I can say I'm my own stuff, but I'm caught up in my own stuff, and so I have my, a too high view of myself. But then there's the other side of the spectrum. There's those who think of themselves too lowly to themselves, of I don't belong here. And if I don't belong here, I don't know how I can contribute. Oh, woe's me. Both are, are things of pride. It took me a long time in my life to figure out. I often thought that side was pride. But then I realized if I think that somehow that I'm an obstacle to what God is wanting to do because of my own insecurities, there's pride in that as well. And so he says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but also think of yourself with sober judgment according to the grace that's been given to you. So there's grace at work in, to, in, in you. And so you've got to figure out, okay, how do I best belong to each other in the midst of it? I'll keep reading. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed, has distributed to only some of you. To the grace that's only be given to only a couple people in the room at the moment. No, he says, to the grace that has been distributed to each of us. Scripture will say this, that he who ascended, also descended, speaking of Jesus, also descended, speaking of the Holy Spirit, and gave gifts to all men. There's a gift in you. There's a gift of God in you. And I'm not just trying to get through a sermon. I'm trying to say that there is a gift of the Holy Spirit living inside you. And we get this wonderful privilege of figuring out, okay, what does that look like? He goes on to say this. For just as each one has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ Jesus, um, though we are many, we form one body. And then here it is. Here's the part. Here's what it says. And each member belongs to all the others. Each member of the body of Christ belongs to all of the others. And so there is this connecting to God that happens, but there's also this connecting to each other. It's connecting to people that starts to happen. And so when we pray, we say, Lord... Please give me one person to share your love with. Lord, let me connect with you. But as I connect with you, what happens, it flows out of love God with all your heart, soul, and mind to now love your neighbor as yourself and understanding that, that you have something to contribute. You have a part to play in the midst of it. And so we, we pray for people. 
So you know who you are. You're a son or daughter of the Almighty God. You're part of the family. To know whose you are, that we belong to each other. And that's a, that for me is like, it's, I don't want to say it's a new thought, but it's a new thought in the, it, it, thinking about the church. It's like, man, we belong to each other. That's so why if you read through 1 John, I know I said Romans 8, go read Romans chapter 8, but also read 1 John. It's filled with these one another's. Love one another, care for one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, correct one another, all of these one another's, because I need you. I mean, hopefully you need me and I need you. We need each other, and so we got to learn how to one another well. And so, so here's the third part. The third part is to do your job. Whatever your job is, you have a job. You have a job within the kingdom of God. You're invited. You're invited. This beautiful invitation to be who you are, loved by God, to connect with people, knowing that you belong to them, but then to also do the job that God has called you to do. It's, it's a call up. I'm not just calling you out. It's a call up. It's like, who has God made you to be? Who has God made you to be? And now, now step into it and say, okay, I'm going to do whatever job he's called me to do. So I grew up in Indiana. Part of the cowboy stuff, perhaps, but I was northwest Indiana, so I, I, if I was a little more southern, the cowboy would have made a lot more sense. Um, but I grew up in Indiana. Crossroads of the nation is what it's called, and it's called that because there's so many railroad trains that go through it. I don't know if you've ever gone through Indiana, but particularly where I lived, as, you're, as they're coming through Chicago, the whole train yards of Chicago, there's a lot of trains. And so you hardly go anywhere without getting stopped at a train track. And a lot of people had bugged them. I loved it. I love trains. I love the sound of trains. We used to have a dog that would always howl at the trains. And so me and him would just, her, me and her would just howl at the trains all night. I was weird. Uh, who cares? Um, and so, so, I, so sometimes on the way to church or on the way to work, you get stopped at the tracks, and I didn't care. Sometimes you would count cars, but as you'd count cars, I also would notice all the different cars. You got the engine, of course, that's pulling everything. You have the cattle car, which is kind of cool, all cows being pulled down, wondering what in the world's going on with us right now. You have, you have, the, liquid, you have the liquid cars. The, the ones that are carrying, like, I don't know what they were carrying. Like, I don't know if it's hazardous material, hazardous material or, or milk. I don't know what they get, or water. I don't know what they're carrying, but you have those cars. You have cars carrying other cars, uh, you know, other, other cars that are they're taken to somewhere else. You have cars carrying actual cars, like vehicles, hey, vehicle cars. You have, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the ones that I see, but I think you're getting the point. They're all different cars. They're going the same direction. They're being pulled and led by the same engine on the same tracks together, and they're all different. You could say, well, but the differences are actually what make whatever destination all the more important because some people need cars and some people need cattle and some people need milk. I don't know who needs hazardous materials, but some people need it somewhere, like something is needed, and the fact that it needs transport, and I thought about that in terms of the church, and what, what Paul will say is like, man, we have all been gifted differently. And if we were all cattle cars, there'd be too much cattle. And if we're all car cars, what would they be carrying? He'll talk about this in 1 Corinthians, about parts of the body. Um, but it goes on to say this. We have different gifts. This room, we have different gifts. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Again, I, I think it's the third time now in this text that says, you cannot duck this. You have a gift at work inside you. We have different gifts that has been given and distributed to each of us. If, it, if your gift is prophesying, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And please know that this is not the end of the list. That there is a whole exhaustive, there's a whole list out there. There's a whole ways in which God wants to use your life to be a blessing to those to whom you belong and a blessing to the world around us. But here's the thing is we've got to be willing to do our job. We've got to be willing to say, and this is the kicker. We have to be willing to say, okay, God, my life is your life. But I'm a living sacrifice. I laid myself on the altar and I said, I'm yours. And however you want to use me and wherever you want to use me and whatever time you want to use me, and whatever part of me you want to use, my mouth, my hands, my feet, whatever part of me you want to use, my ear, whatever part of me you want to use, it's yours. I'm a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. And I can tell you that when you make that decision, it is the best decision of your life. It sounds like, why would I give myself to something else, to, to someone else, and yet, 
I'll tell you it's the best thing that you can do. I'm not the best uh, organizer. I like things to just kind of happen. It's a gift and a flaw. And so sometimes I realize that you need structure. Like if we're on a train and we're all shoveling coal, which, you know, the old trains where you'd shovel coal, you, there's work to be done. You shovel, I don't know how it all worked. I, you shovel coal and it takes some work. What you start to realize is that it's, it, it takes a plan. If God has a calling on your life and God says, I've gifted you, then I got to figure out, okay, how has God gifted me? What am I going to do about it? I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to figure out, okay, God, okay, God. For some of you, it's like, well, I don't even know what my gift is. Here's what I would say. You could take online tests and stuff like that. You could, and they, they can be helpful. But here's what you really do is ask the people around you because you've been blessing them. You've been blessing them to whatever gift, whether you know it or not. You've been blessing them in some way. And so usually the people around you know the way that you've been gifted. And so the first thing is like, okay, figure out, okay, God, how have you made me? Who have you made me? I'm yours. I'm each other's. We're each other's. And now, Lord, help me to step into your mission, which is the third part, um, the mission, a city on a hill. When we say, okay, God, we are willing to be used by you in your mission so you ask people, ask people, okay, how do, you, how, how do you think God wants to use me in my mission? And then I'm going to make a plan. Okay, this is how God has gifted me. Okay, this is what my next step is. I, this is what I'm going to do next. But after you make a plan, you have to be disciplined in the plan. Like, we, we, we might have a lot of January firsters, right? A lot of, like, oh, man, this is what I'm going to do. Praise God, he wants to use my life. And all of a sudden, woohoo! I'm going to make a plan of everything I'm going to do. But then we sometimes lack the discipline to, like, actually do it or actually follow what God is calling us to do. He's inviting us into it. But here's what I might say. There are probably obstacles that are coming against you in the midst of it. Because the third thing is don't quit. I have watched it and experienced it. The moment when you say, okay, God, I'm in. I'm with you. I'm going to do it. And all of a sudden, you step out in faith and you hit a wall. Have any of you hit a wall? Any of you hit a wall after saying, Jesus, yes, I will do it? <laughs> and you're like, Jesus, I just said I would do it. I don't understand. You said I would do it. And now I'm hitting all these walls. And I don't understand why all these walls are coming here. And, and because I think, because it's not just, we're not just operating in, 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 we're not just operating without spiritual forces mounted against us that are trying to deceive us and saying, oh, you might as well just give up now. There's no hope. The word that struck me in um, the past year or so, thinking about Franklin specifically, is the word grit. And it hasn't left me, the word grit. It's like God wants to do something here. God wants to do something in this place, and we can make a plan, and we can be disciplined in the plan, and you don't quit. I'm convinced that God moves through his people and wants to move through this city. And so we step into it knowing who we are, knowing whose we are, and doing the job that he's called us to. And I think if we stick with him, and we, if we hold on and we say, God, move in our world and move in our midst. Lord, Lord we're going to pray every day that you stir the hearts of Franklin, that you stir the hearts of our friends, that you stir the hearts of our family, that you stir the hearts of of those that we may not even see or know to pray for right now, Lord, show us every day who, who you want to send us to as your church. Things start to happen. If you, if you want to look to anyone who knew a plan, was disciplined in the plan even when it got hard, I think of Jesus in the garden where he's like, Father, if there is any other way for your plan to be accomplished, please show me your way. But he goes on to say, but I will not quit. I will not do my will. I will do your will. And so we, we celebrate every Sunday, we celebrate communion together, and it's this beautiful reminder when Jesus says, this is my body given, given for you. And in Romans chapter 12, it's like, these are our bodies given for you. It's this beautiful exchange between each other. It's like, here it is, God, here's my body given to you. And so we gather together and we say, God, our body's given for you as your body has been given to us. And so we say yes to Jesus. And so we say yes as we take communion to him. Jesus poured out his blood for us. For God so loved the world. This is the extent, this is how much he loved the world, that he sent his son to shed blood for you and for me, which doesn't make sense that God would do that, but that's what he did. And so we do this in remembrance of him. We do this to our king. Would you all stand with me? One thing we want to do as a church, it's part of that belonging to each other, it's to pray for each other. If 
there's a way that we can be praying for you. Tammy and Luke are down here in the front. I'll be down here in the front if you need prayer. Um, we'd love to be praying for whatever whatever is going on in your life, whatever way we can help. If 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 you're like if you've been on the fringe of like Jesus and 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 whether or not you belong, can I say if I haven't said it clear enough, you belong. Because if we are estimating by our own worth and value based on like our morality, like none of us belong here. But because of what Jesus has done, you belong and you're invited into the family. And so you can be baptized into him. That's how we do it as the church. We're like, God, my life is yours, and I want to be buried with you in the waters of baptism, be raised to life in you through the waters of, of baptism. And so you're invited, um, if you haven't yet, to be baptized into him. Luke and Tammy and I will be down here if that's something you would like to do. Um, I'm going to pray for us. Father, here's your church. Lord, all different train cars, all looking different. And Father, sometimes we envy the... Uh, the appearances of others. Sometimes we envy the, um, the ways in which you gift other people. Lord, help us to stop it. And simply know who we are in you. Father, the voices that are in our head that uh, hold us back, the insecurities, the insufficiencies, Lord, we lay them all down. Lord, we ask that, that in your name, in your power, that, that we might know that our lives are yours, that we are yours, and we are one another's. And so, Lord, I pray that you show us, show us how you want us to serve. Show us how you want us to love. Show us the ways in which you're calling us forward. Thank you for everyone here right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. filthy feet here I am Lord send me if it's loving one another even when we don't agree here I am Lord send me if I serve you just the same here i am lord send me on the mountain or the valley i will choose to praise here i am lord send me and if i'm known by how i love let my Reflect how much I love you, I love you, and before you even ask, oh, my answer will be yes, cause I love you, I love you. standing in your glory I'll be glad I chose to say here I am Lord send me well done good and faithful I live to hear you say here I am Lord send me we say is so beautiful and so great and he is going to equip us to do everything that he's called us to do because he is good and he loves us so well so we sing praise God
hope you leave here tonight knowing that you are loved by God and by us and by each other. We love you and we'll see you next time. I hope you stay around for some pizza. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Love you guys.